This is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the opening keynote for the 2016 Global Education Conference. This is our sixth anniversary of this event. We're just thrilled to be here and thrilled to have you with us. Lucy Gray and I are co-chairs of, of this event. Lucy, are you there? Do you need moderator privileges? Let me give Lucy moderator privileges. I wasn't planning I'll let Lucy on, say hi. I'm here. I wasn't planning on moderating, so I came in on the regular link. But hi, everyone. We're glad to have you here. Thanks for coming. A huge and special thanks to our sponsors and supporters for this conference. Uh, really just love this crowd of people who, who support this event and who keep it as an authentic collaboration amongst global peers. So special thanks this year to VIF. International Education and TES, uh, as well to our founding co-sponsors, the Global Campaign for Education and Iron USA, a new sponsor this year, Otis, and to the rest of this great gang, we really appreciate you. So this is your chance in the audience to indicate where in the world you are at this moment. Look to the left of the map. You're going to look for the star icon. You're going to click on that. And it opens out and gives you some options. You want to click on the star again or anything that you'd like and place yourself on the map by clicking on the map. You're welcome to put a note in the chat as well. It's always fun to know where people are in the world. So it looks like we've got Middle East, Northern Africa, Europe, the United States, maybe Peru and Brazil. Asia could be Thailand. Japan maybe. This is maybe the most fun part of any session for me is seeing the locations around the world. It's really kind of a thrill to know that we're connecting in this way. We welcome you. Keep making notes in the chat, but we'll need to move forward from the slide to give our keynotes the fullest amount of time possible. Okay, so at this time, I'm going to turn things over to Catherine, Miriam, Hannah, and Mohana. Welcome, and take it away. Thank you, Steve. Um, this is Christine. I'm going to jump in first um, before our our keynote speakers um, share their stories with us. And I, I want to say welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining um, the opening keynote of the sixth conference. Um, we're really excited to be kicking off International Education Week with all of you. I'm Christine McCaleb, um, a YES program manager at IRON USA. And um, the, the Kennedy Luger Youth Exchange and Study Program is, is a really special program um, that uh, was established by Congress in October 2002 in response to the events of September 11th. And it is funded by the U.S. Department of State and sponsored by the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. It's a high school, it brings high school students from countries with significant Muslim populations to, with, to receive scholarships to, to spend up to one academic year in the U.S. They live with host families, they attend high school, they engage in activities um, to learn about American society and values, uh, and oops, I'm just going to ask, I think we're moving through slides, I'm going to let it stay there. Um, and so they live with the host families, they, they go to high schools, they learn about American society and values, they acquire leadership skills, and, and then help educate Americans about their own countries and cultures by living in the community and sharing, um, sharing about their lives back home. And this is the first class of, the, of YES. Uh, students are recruited from 14 different countries and territories around the world. And today, the YES program brings nearly 900 students from 40 different countries and territories every year with uh, the hard work of a consortium of about 20 partner organizations. So the program was such a success that its sister program, the YES Abroad program, was then launched in 2009, giving high school students in the U.S. a similar experience serving as youth ambassadors of the United States, 
high school students from the U.S. would go to go to spend one academic year in one of 11 countries, promoting mutual understanding by forming lasting relationships with their host families and the communities, engaging in the local culture, et cetera, and then bringing that back home to the United States. Um, so now, 13 years later, uh, both of these programs have nearly 9,000 alumni worldwide serving as cultural ambassadors, youth leaders, and community change makers. And so today, we're really excited. You'll hear from four of them about their cross-cultural perspectives on exchange. We have Catherine joining us, who was a Yes Abroad scholar in Morocco uh, in 2013-2014. Miriam was a YES student from Morocco, early years of the YES program, um, and she was placed in Colorado for the 2005-2006 program year. Hannah is a YES Abroad Scholar who was in Malaysia for 2012-2013. And then finally, Mahana, who is a YES alumna from Malaysia, and she was also placed in Colorado for the 2010-2011 year. And so before um, I welcome our first speaker, Catherine, I just wanted to share with all of you that are, those of you that are living in the United States currently and are possibly interested in being a host family or a host school to a YES student, um, or, if, or even if you know a high school student who would maybe be interested in the YES Abroad program, you can learn more about both of these programs on the respective websites that are listed here on the screen. Um, and just a side note that YES Abroad applications for the 2016 and 2017 year are currently open until December 1st. So um, hopefully the following stories will help and will encourage you to learn more and um, to participate by, by being a host or promote, encouraging a student to apply. So um, enough of me. Um, I'll go ahead and let Catherine now take the stage. Um, and just note that I'll be collecting questions throughout, and we'll have some time at the end to ask questions of our, uh, our panelists. So thank you. Go ahead, Catherine. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for that introduction, Christine. I'm so excited to be here. And um, I, as um, Christine mentioned, my name is Catherine Cartier, and I studied in Rabat, Morocco from 2013 to 2014. And I'm now 19 years old, and I'm studying at um, Lester B. Pearson United World College of the Pacific in the chosen British Columbia, so a small town in British Columbia. So. Um, I'm going to be giving a small introduction to Rabat, the city, and then moving through three aspects of my exchange that are meaningful and also um, touch on how it remains important to me to this day. So um, on this slide, you can see uh, three pictures of Rabat, Morocco. Um, Rabat is located on the Atlantic coast and has a population of about one million. So I'm from a small town in southwest Michigan, and growing up I was always craving exploration, craving the chance to go somewhere completely new and immerse myself in that place, and Rabat is the first place that I was able to do that. So I lived two blocks away from the ocean, and you can see um, a river that separates Rabat from its sister city on the top side, and you can also see the Medina, which is a walled city. Um, where many goods are sold, and I found that to be a wonderful place to explore. Um, on the right, you can see the street where my school was, and one element of my exchange was going to um, a small private um, French language high school. So um, to touch a bit about my host family, which was one of the greatest joys of my exchange, I lived with my host mother and three host sisters, all of whom were older than me. And in my home in the United States, I have two brothers, so it was a great joy to be surrounded by all this wonderful sisterly energy. We spent a lot of time together at home. So on the left, you can see the picture of the view out my window. Before I came to Morocco, I had never heard the dawn or the call to prayer before. And the first time I heard it in my host family, I remember the windows shaking, and I was it was just... So such a loud and new sound, and I remember feeling so excited that, that it, it was a moment when I finally realized that I was in a very different place than the United States, um, which I had left behind. And um, in the middle, you can see a plate of couscous, and one of the things that I really, which is a Moroccan dish that's very delicious, and every Friday, families gather together to eat couscous and to um, spend time together. And one of the things that I loved to do with my host family was cook. 
Uh, we spent a lot of time together at home, and much of that time was in the kitchen. So I learned how to prepare traditional Moroccan dishes, and it also was a wonderful way for me to develop my language skills. In Morocco, uh, Morocco is a very multilingual society, and I think the United States can learn so much from that. So the dialect of Arabic that is spoken in Morocco is called Darija. And um, while I was studying in French when I was in Morocco, and I had studied French before, I knew about three words of Darija when I arrived at my host family. And um, while I, was, I could communicate with my host sisters in French, my host mother only uh, spoke, spoke Darija, and she spoke um, Amazir, which is an indigenous language to Morocco as well. So through learning to cook, through helping out around the house, I was able to improve my Darija, and to the point at the end of the year where I was able to explain to her the Yes Abroad program and why it is significant to me um, in in Darija, and so that was a very proud, um, proud moment for me. And um, my host family and I still talk. Um, we talked last week, and it's wonderful to know. They ask me when I'm going to come home and when I'm going to visit, and it's very beautiful to know that in another place across the world there are people who love me, and they know that I love them, and that I would always, I'm always hoping that I will have a chance to go back as soon as possible. Another um, element of my exchange that I really enjoyed was English language volunteering. So when I came to Morocco, I was looking for different ways to engage with my community. I had volunteered at home, and an important element of the SFRAT program is service to the community. So um, I started helping out with various programs. And on the left, you can see uh, me and some other Yes Abroad students with um, Access students. So the Access program is an English language learning program that's run by U.S. embassies around the world. And I was able to be sort of a teacher's assistant at that program. And I think while I was sharing songs from the United States and games, I was gaining so much myself because my first friends in Morocco were access students. I, I struggled um, with adjusting to my new school. And when I went to this program, the students were, I was um, 17 at the time, and the students were around the same age as me. And we had an immediate connection, which really made me feel really affirmed why I was in Morocco. Um, and then on the right, you can see me with some of my own students. Later in the year, I took on teaching uh, my own class at an NGO. So I was basically given complete reign. Um, the people who worked at the NGO told me that these students don't know any English, and you can teach them whatever you want. So I just started teaching them the basics. Um, and it was, it was a great, there was a big learning curve there. I think I have a lot more respect for my teachers now. But I, I also learned a lot about the Moroccan education system because um, I also volunteered at a public high school. So I saw, I went to a private high school. But while volunteering at a public high school, I really saw the differences in the educational systems. And I came to understand perhaps, I find that very interesting to see the dynamic between teachers is very different or students. And I really, that's something that I've reflected a lot about um, now that I'm back from my exchange. And then to touch on another element of the Yes Abroad program, uh, the capstone project. So every Yes Abroad student, um, this is a newer element of the program, is asked to complete some sort of project about their year, um, whether that be community service or some sort of research. And I found myself absolutely fascinated by the public baths in Morocco, which are called Hemmam. And the Hemmam is not just a bath. I found it to be a wonderful space to <clears throat> Um, meet new people and to just be able to converse in a very comfortable way um, with whoever I stumbled upon on that particular day. So I took on my um, capstone of researching the public baths in Morocco. So um, these are pictures of two doors of public baths. So I visited over, um, they're called hemmem. So I visited over 15 hemmems during my time in Morocco. And I eventually did some interviews with women who worked there, and I also just spent so much time observing and discussing the Hammam with um, women that I met in Morocco, and I found it was a place where I could hear stories from people of all different ages, from girls who were my own age who would come and ask me 
um, have you ever been to have men before between, uh, or small children who I would play with or older women, I would help them to fill their buckets. So it was a place where I was able to practice my language skills as well as just have those casual neighborly conversations that, that one has when you share, share a place with people. So uh, today I am um, currently at the dot on the far left um, southern tip of Vancouver Island. And as I look back at my Yes Abroad experience, it remains very relevant to me. The news that happens in Morocco, as well as just um, the relationships I have with people there, <coughs> time with people there, are still so much a part of, of who I am. And I now I go to an international school, and having been through the process of adjusting to a whole new culture gives me perhaps more understanding and awareness of, of what my peers might go through when they come from their countries to Canada to study. And also, being um, having been a Yes Abroad student, I think I learned to be adaptable and to be flexible. And so now I, I truly believe that I can make my home anywhere in the world. And if an opportunity were to come, for me to go study in India or in Malaysia or any other place, I think I would feel confident in taking that because I believe that the skills I learned about Yes Abroad, they're not just, uh, during Yes Abroad, they're not just applicable to Morocco. It's not just learning Arabic, learning French, learning about the Hemmem. It's about learning for me to be confident in myself, how to ask questions, um, how to truly follow my curiosity. And I believe that those skills will, will help me to feel at home um, wherever I go. So Yes Abroad really gave me that, that first step out the door. And so if you would like to, in the chat room, you can maybe type what was your first experience away from home or the first time you felt truly independent. And I think for me, Yes Abroad is that experience and that I, um, that's what Yes Abroad gave to me and for other high school students, I think it is for people I, um, I witnessed, I saw how they grew and now my parents saw it and now I'm seeing uh, two, three years later that Yes Abroad really remains a part of my story and I'm excited to see um, where I go from here as I'm going to be returning to the U.S. to attend university in the next year. So thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Okay, Miriam, um, we're excited to hear your side of the story now, um, coming from Morocco. Thank you, Christine. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for your great um, presentation about Morocco. It made me feel really nostalgic about my own country, knowing that I'm now talking to you from France. But of course, I lived most of my life in Morocco, got my education in Morocco, and still connect with uh, Morocco. Um, uh, my part of the presentation will be about my own um, foreign uh, exchange experience in the USA, more specifically in the state of Colorado, uh, in a little town called Brighton. And as uh, Catherine has um, uh, put forward in her part of the presentation, yes, the YES program or YES Abroad are truly an eye-opening experience that takes you to another level of, uh, you know, discovery, not only discovering, you know, a different community or a different life setting, but discovering even lots and lots and lots about your own person. Um, so uh, here in my presentation, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my own experience in Colorado, but I'll also give, um, g give you uh, an idea of my experience back to my country after my uh, exchange uh, experience and what I could do in terms of community service and uh, community involvement. So here you have two main um, uh, pictures of me and my host family, the Kellys, uh, two daughters, uh, host dad, host mom, a lot of stops. Uh, it's kind of in, in the countryside, so we have a lot of great time doing outdoors activities and such. And it was, um, you know, a great pleasure for me also to discover that side of the United States because it's not only what we see on movies and, you know, all the, um, you know, the downtown, big city life that we see in the, you know, uh, in, in, on TV. Uh, 
uh, it's also another another side of, um, of you know communities. American communities live in a very normal way, but also very exciting. Um, uh, also, a lot of friends that I could uh, make uh, throughout my uh, exchange experience, not only through school but also through other activities, including sports. I was involved mainly in two clubs, um, um, cross country and uh, soccer diversity team. So that was an amazing opportunity, you know, to get in touch with uh, uh, American students and and exchange views on so many things. Um, actually. Here, um, um, it's uh, it's a slide where it's 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 to vehicle this a funny uh, uh, interpretation of the world of the word Colorado uh, from the, from Morocco to the USA. So here you can see two uh, opposite um, uh, pictures. One reflects uh, obviously one of the canyons in in Colorado in the USA. But Colorado in Morocco means it's actually the name of a very known and uh, uh, popular company for paint. So whenever I told about my, I talked about my experience in Colorado when I came back to Morocco, people thought I was talking about the paint, and uh, that got me, you know, involved in long discussions explaining, you know, what it is and it, that it's, you know, a geographical parts of the United States and. Uh, with history too, with a lot of uh, gorgeous uh, um, nature. So, um, of course, when you go as part of an exchange program, not only you discover your host country, but you get the opportunity to talk about a lot about your own country to people. So that bridges a lot of links between where you come from and where you actually you're hosted. Uh, so here, I got the opportunity to, you know, to. Uh, to receive friends and host family members uh, in Morocco. So here you have uh, different pictures uh, from Rabat, the, 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 the picture underneath, and then Fez, and uh, our um, traditional salon in, uh, at our home. So here, um, I think if I spend time talking about my experience, I could talk uh, you know, for, for ages, because um, it was just a truly eye-opening experience. Now, what happened after the experience was also interesting in terms of you know coming back, getting involved in your studies, uh, doing loads of stuff that are of course uh, academic focused and academic oriented. But also, we had this opportunity to meet uh, different um, delegations from yes alumni from different countries in the in DC in 2009. So that means three three years after I finished my uh, my exchange year. And that got me and other fellows from Morocco think about the eventuality of creating what we call the Yet Alumni Association, through which we wanted to get more involved in the community and volunteering, and of course create some impact and make it last. So here, uh, just um, briefly, you can have you know th th that was the initial group uh, that actually put the association together. Here you have. Different pictures of the association. We made T-shirts with the logo. We got, you know, brainstorming sessions where we started thinking of um, different kinds of topics and 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 projects that we could um, start in our respective communities. Of course, there are so many challenges because uh, you know the initiative and the energy and um, and how you think of the project in a in a for, at a first uh, level is not always uh, implementable the same way in reality. And of course, you want it to be the best out of you, the best out of your team. And of course, you need to go through different hurdles, speak with different stakeholders, get your uh, idea, have more, uh, more uh, support and funding, uh, especially. Of course, the Amity's and the YES program from DC, um, the US Embassy were always there to help and to support. Uh, starting from uh, you know providing room to to have different kinds of meetings and also different mini grants, what we call the yes mini grants, there are a uh, small amount of money that don't go beyond two hundred fifty dollars per alum uh, in order to start you know any kind of project but it needs to have sustainable uh, uh, you know it needs to be sustainable through time that means not only buying you know uh, charity uh, uh, components to give away to people, but actually think of something creative and innovative. So, just to sum up, 
uh, and to give you an idea of um, how the yes experience is really impacting a lot of students' lives, it doesn't actually end at the at the at the at the tenth or eleventh month of your experience, depending on how much time you actually spend in each country. But it actually goes beyond that to human uh, relations that you keep with your your communities and such, and also with the uh, with the initiatives that you can actually create with your fellow alumni at your own country where you can create so many start new projects, initiatives, and you actually keep thinking and, and, and making it better through experiences, through different generations that add up to the program. Now we can count over 100 alum, alum over 100 or 120 alum, uh, alumni from Morocco and each generation there are, you know, new, uh, New groups now. The DF Alumni Association has got different generations through it. So a lot of uh, a lot of um, students start new projects in even different parts of the country that we didn't even know before. But through the Yes program, we can start uh, such initiatives and, and make it go wider and larger and impact more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miriam. Um, that was wonderful. And again, anyone, if you have questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat box, and we will. Um, I'm saving them for the question and answer time at the very, very end. Um, next, we're moving on to Hannah, and um, she's going to again. She's a yes abroad student in Malaysia, and we'll hear from her. Thanks, Hannah. So hi, everyone. Um, as has been said, my name is Hannah, and I studied abroad in Malaysia for the 2012-2013 academic year, and I'm really excited to be here today and share my story with you all. Okay, so I spent my sophomore year abroad in Ipoh, Malaysia. Ipoh is a town in the northern part of the country. Um, I lived with a host family, attended a local school, but I'll talk all, all about that in a little bit. I'm a current freshman at Washington College in Chestertown, Maryland. And I have to mention this, um, I don't know if you've seen the news today, but there is a gun threat on campus. I'm fine, I'm safe, we're just on lockdown and we're in our dorms for the day. But if you see anything, I'm fine, <laughs> don't worry. Um, I, Washington College, I'm studying international studies, anthropology, and double minoring in Chinese and Spanish. So it's very clear that um, my time abroad has influenced my career choices, and I really am enjoying studying these different things. So where is Malaysia? I got that question a lot before I went overseas. A lot of people were like, mm, are you living in trees? Like, is Malaysia an island? Or um, where, where exactly is this country? So it's between Thailand and Singapore. Um, this is in Southeast Asia. It's near Vietnam, Cambodia, Myanmar, all those countries. Um, and marked on this map, you can see my host town of Ipoh, marked off with the blue dot. So I'm, I'm was about two and a half hours away from the capital city of Kuala Lumpur. And I was also like four hours away from the border of Thailand. So here are some photos from my daily life in Malaysia. Um, on the top left, we have a picture that was taken in my host family's living room. It's all decked out because it was a holiday, and um, there are some gifts that we were going to give. Um, on the side, we have a picture of me with my host cousin. And on the bottom, there's a picture of the national flower of Malaysia, the Bunga Raya, um, the hibiscus. So it's very pretty. So the biggest thing that I took away from my time in Malaysia was a deeper understanding of the culture there. There's an idea in Malaysia of Satu Malaysia. It means one Malaysia, directly translated. And it's kind of an idea of unity and diversity. Malaysia is made up of a bunch of different cultures, the Malay, Chinese, Indian, and Oranasi, which means um, like native people, so the aboriginals of the land. Um, Malaysia is also split. Um, if we go back to the map, you actually don't have half of it, but this is the peninsular part, and then there's the part with Borneo where it's an island shared with Indonesia. Um, so the culture in Malaysia, it's kind of like four countries in one because you can go to one family, a Malay family and have a completely different experience than like you might with a Chinese family. So the, uh, that being said, tied to the cultures, traditions, and festivals are extremely important and a huge part of Malaysia. It felt like I had a week off from school just about every month because 
of the different events that were going on, the different holidays, things like that. Um, and I'm also going to talk a little bit later about the family structure when I mention my host family. So this is Malaysian Indian culture. Um, most of the Indians in Malaysia are Hindu, however there are some Christians. Um, the top left picture is me in a traditional gown. Um, this is actually a funny story. My host family um, just kind of told me one night when I got home from school that there is this event going on at the temple and I needed to get all dolled up and we um, ended up carrying flowers from one temple to another um, to honor the gods and kind of I guess pay our respects to them by show, giving them flowers um, and it was kind of one of those experiences where I didn't know that morning that I would be partaking in the festival and by the end of the night I was um, at this temple surrounded by people in this big line of people carrying the flowers chanting, singing songs, all sorts of things. And it's kind of surprising how often things like that would happen. Um, some of the other pictures in this, there's a henna tattoo, some traditional Indian snacks, um, a temple, me with one of my Indian host families. And in the bottom left, uh, bottom right, excuse me, there's a picture of a rangoli, which is a design made out of colored rice that we do for the Hindu festival of Deepavali, which actually just happened. So next up, um, I guess the caption got deleted, but this is Malaysian Chinese culture. Um, I actually stayed with another American host family for Chinese New Year in Johor Bahru, which is about half an hour from Singapore. And we actually did get to go into Singapore to celebrate Chinese New Year, which was a really fascinating experience. It's amazing how different Singapore is from Malaysia, even though it's a half an hour away. Um, in the top middle, we have dim sum. I have to say that Malaysian Chinese food is probably some of my favorite food that I did have. Um, the other pictures, there's some temples, some lanterns, just some pictures of my experience with Chinese culture in Malaysia. Finally, we have Malay culture, and um, my host family was Malay, so I probably had the most exposure to this culture. Um, the two biggest festivals for the Malays of Malaysia are the Eid festivals, so there's Eid Idol Fitri, which happens after Ramadan, the Islamic month of fasting. Um, and that's actually when I met my first, second host family, who I stayed with the entire year. It was, um, I fasted with them for five days for Ramadan. And let me tell you, in 90 degree weather, when you can't drink water, fasting is very difficult. I don't know if any of you have tried it, but certainly a challenge. Um, in the top right, we have me and my host mother, who I love dearly and miss so much. Um, and then there's some other pictures of some of the other festivals, the other Eid festival. Um, and then we have just some, just some other pictures of my time um, with Malay culture. So next we have school in Malaysia. And I have to say school in Malaysia was probably the hardest part of adjusting for me. I went to Skola Meninga Kabangsaan Main Convent Ipo. Um, SMK, main convent Ipo, because that is a mouthful to say. Um, it was extremely different from my high school in America, which is in a pretty suburban town about an hour away from New York. Um, so suddenly I was from this pretty liberal-minded school into this all-girls, very strict school. So the teachers in Malaysia switched classrooms, and the students stay in the same place, which was kind of an interesting adjustment. It also meant that I was with the same group of 40 girls um, for the entire day. So I got very close with the students in my class and learned a lot from them. There are also uniforms at Malaysian schools, and you'll see pictures of those in a minute. They're something very, um, very different from my, my typical school wear in the U.S. In Malaysia, the high school is divided into two tracks, the science track and the humanities track. Science track, you take more science and math-based courses, and humanities is more geography, history, um, kind of literature courses. And most of the science uh, subjects are taught in English, although it's kind of up to the discretion of the teacher a little bit as to what language they wanted to teach in. Um, and the Harry Potter effect, that's kind of a, a joke I make about my school in Malaysia. So uh, like I said, everyone wore the uniforms. And there actually were four houses in my school in Malaysia, the red, yellow, green, and blue house. So it's kind of like the four houses in Harry Potter. And um, the principal of the school is called a headmistress. And there are also prefects who had special uniforms and special privileges. So I guess you can kind of see the parallels. I just thought it was kind of funny when I first was at school there. So here are some pictures. Um, you'll notice in the top left I'm wearing a different uniform than in all the other pictures. That's because I was a Girl Scout in Malaysia. 
Um, and it was kind of interesting because I was never a Girl Scout in the U.S., so it was interesting that such an American thing I only had exposure to when I was abroad. Um, the middle top is my class, uh, the 40 girls, and that's our class teacher in the front. Um, the top right is probably one of my favorite memories <laughs> from Malaysian school. Um, my teacher, my biology teacher, decided one day that he was going to climb up this tree and cut down coconuts for us. So he cut down these coconuts and just took his giant knife and whacked them open for us, and we all drank coconut juice um, just because he felt like doing that for that day. Um, the bottom left two pictures are from my school. It's very beautiful, and that's a typical Malaysian classroom. Okay. Next, I'll talk a little bit about my host family. Uh, host family was definitely one of the most beneficial parts of the experience. Um, I had a host mother, a host father, two host sisters, and a host brother. However, my older host sister and younger host brother attended school, um, boarding school and college. So I didn't really have them as, at home that often. So I was with a younger host sister for most of the time. I lived in a gated house. Um, it's just kind of a Malaysian thing. You tend to have a gate around your house. Um, this did mean that I got locked out a few times because there was only one key, and I had to wait for my host family to let me in, which was kind of a funny experience. So some of the family activities that I was part of with my host family, eating. Uh, this is a huge part of Malaysian culture. In fact, the first thing that someone will ask you after they see you um, is suda makan, which means did you already eat? Because it's really important that everyone's well fed and um, kept happy in Malaysia like that. Um, we would watch TV together. My host sister really liked Korean like soap operas, so I had a, a lot of exposure to those, which was kind of funny. Um, visiting villages, we went back to my host father's um, traditional village to see my host grandmother a bunch of times, like for holidays. And then other states, um, I mentioned with the eating thing, sometimes we would drive an hour to get a special dish or a special cuisine from a different part of the country. So my next bullet point, the politics in the spa, was kind of a, a really interesting thing that I experienced. My host father was heavily involved in politics. He was sort of like the mayor for the city that I was in. Um, and that was extremely interesting to experience because I was actually in Malaysia for the election cycle. Um, and the politics there, they're kind of complicated to explain. And it's hard to get a good explanation from anyone in Malaysia as to why it was so complicated. But um, there ended up being a lot of kind of difficulties with conspiracy, um, not conspiracy, like corruption in the politics and, and things like that. So um, it was very interesting to witness from an American perspective and have someone in my family who was so heavily involved in it. Um, on the other hand, my host mother owned a spa. So that was very lovely because one day she would pick me up from school and be like, you know, we're just going to go to the spa today and I'll get spa treatments. And I have to say, I really miss that about my life in Malaysia. <laughs> um, respect for elders is a huge part of Malaysian culture. There's a special greeting that you, um, you kind of do to the elders. It's hard to do without um, demonstrating, but you sort of touch their forehead, uh, your forehead to their hand to show your respect for them. Um, and there's just a lot of different ways to show respect besides that. Um, in some Chinese families, you don't eat until the oldest person at the table says you can. So if they just feel like um, <laughs> they don't want you to eat yet, you're, you're up to their will. Um, finally, I want to mention Christmas in Cambodia. I, my host family and I traveled to Cambodia for the winter break. And it was um, definitely a unique experience to be in a Buddhist country for I am. Um, for such a Christian festival, although there were Christmas trees all all over our hotel lobby, I was um I was you know not able to go to church, and it was 90 degrees. It was just kind of a really unique Christmas experience, but it did bring me closer to my host family, so I'm glad for that. So here are some pictures of me and my host family. Um, the bottom left is during a festival. We're all in Malay traditional dress, the baju kurung. And on the right is in Cambodia. That's why there's a non-Malaysian flag. And that's on a boat cruise that we went on. OK, so a little bit about the challenges I faced with my exchange student and overcame. Obviously, there's the language barrier. Um, I only knew like two words of Malay before I left. And those were words that I picked up at orientation. Um, there's also not a lot of resources to learn Malay online because it's not something that common, um, a common language that people learn in the States. 
So I was kind of left up to my own, and I just learned a lot through immersion, some crazy sign language, things like that. And naturally, I made mistakes. Like one time, I accidentally ordered Icapala um, instead of Icalapa, which means I ordered head water instead of coconut water in a restaurant. And that was like a very awkward experience. But, you know, I never forgot that word after that. So I guess it worked out for the, <laughs> for the better. Um, Naturally, I was homesick at times. Uh, Christmas and my birthday are very close to each other, and that was a little bit of a challenging time, but I found the best way to deal with that was to just spend more time with my host family, let them know how I was feeling, not isolate myself, all, all exchange student things. Um, so then there's also the local coordinators. A lot of the liaisons in Malaysia do study in the capital city of Kuala Lumpur, so it can be hard to find someone that's in your area that you can um, always have there. I did have an amazing um, LP liaison person, as they're called in Malaysia, and he studied in Wisconsin under the YES program, and he was a, a really great resource for me. Finally, the idea of other exchange students. Um, I loved the other Americans that I was with in Malaysia, but I did find that it was very easy to compare my experience, and I was found that when I did that, I um, kind of lost the value of my own experience and why, why it matters to me and how I was learning individually. If you compare all your experiences, um, you feel, it feels like the experience that you're having is not entirely your own. But there's just so much that you can learn as an individual without um, without kind of comparing what you're doing to others. So here are just some uh, Malaysian photo span of why I love Malaysia so much. Um, some of my favorite places in the country, the Patronus Towers, which are pretty iconic. Um, a Hindu temple about to cave. There's a monkey stealing a coconut, and that kind of thing happened a lot. Um, my host family actually had a pet monkey that I didn't know about until like two months after I was living with them. Um, my roommate's in the background laughing about this in my college in my dorm right now. Um, but I heard these um, kind of shrieking noises coming back from the back of the house, and I was very confused until I went out there, and I found out that we had a monkey. So that was, that was a kind of funny story um, with my host family. Um, yeah, so those are just some pictures. So how study abroad changed my life. There's a lot of uh, a lot of the things you hear about, cross-cultural understanding, independence and confidence, flexibility and adaptability, a new language, connections from around the world. Um, so all of these things, as cheesy as they sound, were definitely things that I picked up while I was abroad. I feel like I really grew up as a person. I learned how to be comfortable with myself and putting myself out there in all sorts of situations, whether it be giving a presentation in front of my um, whole school or just kind of uh, talking with a person on the street. Um, so those are all important things that I picked up. And finally, the idea of becoming a global citizen. I definitely learned a lot about what it means to have um, an international understanding and see things from my American perspective, but also kind of recognize and understand the perspectives that other people are coming with. So that's... Um, that's all of my story. Um, if you have any questions, I would love to answer them. Just put them in the box, and we will answer them in the question and answer time. Thank you very much. Hannah, thank you so much. Uh, what a wonderful presentation and great stories that you shared with us. And again, we're really happy that you were able to um, join us and that you are safe at your school. So thank you for sharing. Um, next up is Mahana, and she is going to wrap up our uh, presentations, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers, so don't stop uh, putting them in the chat room. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Can I be very excited? Hi. Hi everyone, my name is Mohana. So I was a returnee from the YES program in year 2010. I was also hosted in Colorado actually, so it was nice to hear the early presentations. So 
Before I can proceed further, let me just tell you about the YES program itself. So the YES program was actually initiated after the 9-11 incident. It was part of an effort to promote a better understanding between the Muslim nations and the United States of America. So students from Islamic countries were, you know, brought to U.S. and our roles were as ambassadors of our country to explain about how our lifestyle is. So for my presentation, I'm going to bring you through like how my experience was in the year 2010 when I started my journey as a global citizen and how the journey has been till today. So when I, moving on to this picture collage, you will be able to see that I put a bunch of pictures from my experience and I'm not going to emphasize so much on the American culture that I learned because I'm pretty sure most of you are already living the culture. So let's see, as an Asian who was hosted in Colorado, I met a lot of people who had no idea about, about Malaysia. Like, like how this now Hannah was presenting to you and like people were asking her where Malaysia was, that was exactly how it was. When I told everyone that I was from US, I'm, I'm from Malaysia, not everyone knew where Malaysia was or even our nearby countries. So I guess that's the make biggest difference because when you are in Malaysia, everyone knows US. So I guess that's one of the biggest culture shocks that you get being a student from a very small country <laughs> and that's when I realized my role as a exchange student not was, was not only to live the American dream where I get to experience American culture, have a whole family and live the American dream but I also had a role to tell people about where I come from and as you know Malaysia is actually a Muslim country but many people do not know that in Malaysia you can actually practice your own religion and you are free to, there are many races living in Malaysia. Sorry everyone, I think she's having a difficult time seeing some of the slides so she, and her connection's cutting out a bit. So we appreciate your uh, your patience. Hello? Yes. So my collage here says that pictures speak a thousand words and if you look at one of the pictures here, it was during my high school, they had a cultural week. And in my cultural week, I just participated in a traditional costume fashion show where I, we need to bring some of the traditional costumes that we had and people would see us dressed in it. But as you realize in Malaysia we have so many races and we have so many traditional costumes. So I had a few traditional costumes that I brought with me and during the fashion show, um, me and a few of my friends, we all wore Malaysian costumes but they were all so different. And when they were explaining about Malaysian tradition, it was the first time that many people in Greeley West High School had actually even heard about the country Malaysia. So that's when I realized exchange is not just a one-way thing. I was not there to only live the American dream, but I was also there to tell people about the difference or the diversity that the whole of Asia has to have, because in Malaysia, we consider ourselves the essence of Asia. So that was how my exchange was in U.S. I learned that I was there to fulfill a role to show people the different cultures of the world 
and during the exchange as well because you meet students from all over the world when you go on an exchange especially when I went under the YES program I was hosted and I got to meet with people from different countries so after my program I came back and that's when I would say the real story or the bigger part actually starts and for me there was a sense of you know you I think not only for me for most people who go back from an exchange there's always a sense of missing back your whole family and the whole experience and there's a sense of you want to keep your exchange going and that's when we get engaged with our alumni networks for me it will be the yes alumni malaysia or afs malaysia and of course there's also afs from there's other countries and there's also yes alumni all from all over the country from other countries when i joined the alumni there were so many activities that we could participate in and most of these activities were relating back to what we had learned during our exchange as I said, I was there to live them. There was such a very, there was such a neat way of disposing garbage. Like every household, they practice recycling, and the garbage disposal was such a neat and clean process. Where else in Malaysia, we don't really practice recycling in our daily life in our household kitchen. So we, who have been to America, when we get back to Malaysia and we were part of our alumni network, we try to promote all this good things or all the positive things that we learned back in our own community. We held campaigns and new programs to encourage people to do recycling. And these were all the small activities that brought the spirit of our exchange together and made us keep trying to keep people engaged. And then, of course, there were also similar programs like the English language camps, like the Greek camp was also done by the Yes alumni in Malaysia because we wanted to go up to kids in rural areas and help them in both English and in Malay. However, in rural areas, English language is not really emphasized on. So we, the Yes alumni, go to these kids in rural areas and encourage them to improve their language and to show them possible opportunities that may come up when they improve their own competence. So that was something that we keep trying, we keep trying to improve our people. Our Apart from that, we also have, the government does a lot of volunteering activities where we encourage each other's ideas and motivation. We keep the energy and we encourage each other to keep trying new activities to do something that's fulfilling to our own selves and also the community. And I'm just going to highlight on a few things that happened this year. Just earlier this year in April, I participated in the Yes Talk. The Yes Talk was a program which was held in Tunisia where a Yes Yes, alumni representatives from all over the world came there to give us a talk about their life, a, some, a personal story that could be used to inspire others. And of course, for me, I was one of the speakers. I was very fortunate because I got to improve on my communication skills and all the things. However, another thing that I took back from that talk was to see different people and their different stories and how we can find unity despite all the political difference social challenges, economical struggles, and differences that we have. And later on this year, there was also a beach cleanup that was done in in my state, Perak, which was also to promote the sense of volunteerism. Now, just recapping again, I explained what happened in year 2010 during my exchange, how I came back after that, participated in the alumni network, in Malaysia and got my opportunity to participate with the alumni overall that I meet. Yes, alumni members from other countries as well. And as of now, if I was to recall my journey and if I had an opportunity to go back to that same girl in year 2009 who was applying for the YES program, I will only tell 
her that she made a good choice in applying for the program and there will be no regrets in having applied and sticking to the program. In fact, I think I can even speak on behalf of every other YES alumni that we will forever be grateful to those who have created and given us this opportunity to be a global citizen. To the U.S. State Department for funding the program, our spending and hosting organizations, and of course, all the families who supported each one of us throughout this experience. We will definitely be very grateful and of course, work towards giving back to our community and work towards fulfilling and being a global citizen. So that's pretty much for Mahan, my part. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You. And again, thank you to our other three presenters, Catherine, Hannah, and Miriam. Um, I think that this gave you such a really rich understanding of your experiences with exchange and in the and in your um, home and host communities uh, and how you, you viewed and what you shared and learned. And it's very clear that um, these experiences were very transformative for you and also for the people that you met um, along the way and who you'll continue to meet on your journey as global citizens. So thank you for sharing. Um, I'd like to open it up now. We only have, I think, a few more minutes um, to answer a few questions. And I I have a couple, right? So while you think about what you'd like uh, the presenters to share, I have a few that you uh, mentioned in the chat room earlier. So let's go ahead and start with, um, I think the question was for, for Catherine and for Miriam, did you, either of you, experience culture shock um, at first? And if you did, could you just briefly, because we only have a couple of minutes, just briefly tell us what that culture shock um, was like and how you can overcame that and maybe what you learned from it. And actually, I'm going to have them just chat it in the chat room because we have to get scooching to the next session, so I, I apologize. Um, but uh, feel free to chat in the chat room before you move on to the next session. Uh, and I, again, I encourage you all, if you're interested in hosting a YES student at your school or in your home, um, you can visit the yesprograms.org. Or if you know a high school student in the United States that is interested in applying for the YES Abroad, program. Um, the deadline for that application is December 1. So you can also visit yes-abroad.org for more information. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope that you enjoy the rest of the Global Education Conference.